Uh, hi, my name is Duncan Coots and I'm the uh, Head of Engineering for the Cardano project and uh, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail uh, than I have in the past about um, some of the things we're doing uh, with how we develop um, high assurance uh, software for Cardano. So some of you might have read uh, a blog post that I wrote uh, some time ago now um, describing in very general terms how we are um, planning to, to improve the, uh, the assurance uh, of, of the software that you write. So I'm just going to recap that slightly and, and explain what is high assurance, what does it mean, uh, and why is it important. And then I'm going to go into maybe a bit more technical detail about some of the um, interesting things that we're working on uh, right at the moment. There's a, there's a whole team that I'm uh, overseeing and we're doing some rather interesting uh, and exciting stuff at the moment and I'll, I'll try and describe um, without getting into too many tricky technical details but I'll do my best um, what, uh, what we're doing at the moment. So just, just to recap, what is, what is high assurance and what does it mean and, and why should you care? Um, so assurance is really about can you be sure that the software that you're using is not going to fail? You know, it's as simple as that. Um, it, it, so it, it's, a, it's about, um, so, so, so think about it like this. Um, you know, cryptocurrencies uh, are, are important things. They have uh, lots of money um, tied up in, in cryptocurrencies. People um, treat them as money, right? That's the whole point. Um, so it's important that the system works. And it's important that you have confidence that the system will work. And these, th these things are made with software. And as everybody knows, uh, software is, um, in general, rather fallible. Um, if you think just about how often software that you use has bugs, crashes, um, you wouldn't want that with the software that underlies your, your cryptocurrency. That would be really bad. And in fact, we've seen lots and lots of examples of this. I mean, um, you just have to look at the, um, uh, at the news uh, in, the, in the cryptocurrency world for um, regular articles about um, failures uh, to do with uh, the software that runs the cryptocurrency. Sometimes that's smart contracts, uh, other times it's, it's other kinds of flaws. Um, but so it's important if, if, if we as a community really believe that cryptocurrencies are for real, then it, it really is important that we uh, take software assurance seriously. Because if we don't, we're not actually being serious about, about cryptocurrencies, right? Um, so software assurance is about saying that this software, giving, giving some evidence and degree of confidence to yourself, to everybody, that this software is going to work as it is intended to work and doesn't have some kind of uh, horrible flaw uh, that would allow a hacker to you know, exploit the system, bring it down, steal everybody's money, that, that kind of thing. So the, the more important the, what the software controls, the, the more important it is that the software is, is high assurance. So good examples of this are things like um, you know, uh, flight control systems in, in aircraft. Um, you know, that's really, really important, you know, life or death, that the software that controls the, how the aircraft behaves is correct, right? Otherwise, everyone on the plane is going to die. So there are existing practices in engineering uh, of how to make high assurance software, but they tend to be very expensive. Um, the, the software, uh, the, the, the flight control example is, is a good example. That, that's a very expensive way of developing software to achieve those levels of, um, of assurance. And so for most ordinary commercial software, people don't do that. And that's what, and because people don't do that, that is why most software is frankly not very good. That's why most software has has bugs, has flaws, has security updates all the time. You know, just just look at how many security updates there are in Windows or Mac OS or Android or you know all these things. Uh, it's not just operating systems, but all sorts of bits of software. Um, they all are continuously having security updates. And why is that? It's because they had bugs in it in the first place. And Perhaps you can fix the bugs before someone discovers them, exploit them, but often not. Um, and what's better would be to say there are no bugs in the system and to have some realistic evidence uh, that that is really true. Um, so the question is, how, do we, how can we achieve high assurance? Well, okay, first of all, there's different levels of assurance um, corresponding to different levels of, of confidence. Um, you know, if you've tested something a bit, maybe you're a bit confident that it doesn't have any bugs. But if you've tested it a lot, maybe you're more confident. Or maybe you can do better than testing, and you can do better than testing. Um, so, so yes, in general, 
assurance, not to be confused with insurance, right? Assurance is, um, is about establishing evidence that software does not have flaws, and it's the degree to which you have uh, that amount of evidence. So like I said, with, this, with, the, with, the, with the aircraft example, um, for that you want really high assurance because people are going to die otherwise. For ordinary commercial software, the assurance level is very low, and there are, there are levels in between. So my goal with, with Cardano is to, to improve the level of assurance. We're not going to hit the, at least not in the short term, we're not going to hit the level of assurance that you get in like the, the aircraft control systems, but we can certainly make do better, um, and that, that's my goal. And, and the way that, that um, we're going to do that um, is to apply more computer science. Um, academic computer science knows how to do these things, they're just not typically done in most commercial software development because it's too expensive usually, or because people don't know how to do it, or inertia, or there's lots of reasons why people don't do it. But in my opinion, those are mostly excuses. And for things that are important, um, and we're putting a lot of money at stake, like cryptocurrencies, then we ought to do it, right? It, it's important that, that these systems don't fail. So <clears throat> there are two basic approaches to achieving high assurance. There's the kind of um, the traditional approach, which has been done since the 60s and 70s, and there's the kind of more modern um, sort of computer science-based approach. And the traditional approach is to be very careful, uh, and you, you, get, you gather evidence about how you make the software, like you, you have to use lots of processes and ISO 9000 certifications, and you, you fill in lots of documents that says who did what and when, and it generates lots and lots of evidence about how you built the software, but it doesn't actually generate evidence about the software at the end, just, just the process by which you got there. Um, and that's been the traditional approach because there was nothing that you could do that was any better. Um, but um, academic computer scientists working since the 80s and even before that uh, have been looking at um, how do you um, reason about programs, how do you use mathematics to, to reason about programs to give you assurance to understand and prove things about programs. And so that, that approach gives us a method where we can, instead of very carefully documenting how we built something, we can generate evidence that the final bit of software is actually correct. So we, we end up with some software and separately evidence in the form of like reasoned arguments, mathematical proofs, of various different kinds, um, evidence about the final software that we produced. So in, in, in that sense, you don't need to know how the software was built, you just need to look at the final evidence about the software that was built. And that, that's kind of the distinction. Um, and we're, we're taking that latter approach, or moving towards that, moving in that direction. So, so what does that mean? So we are applying, we're grabbing various bits of computer science, the, the bits that seem appropriate, that seem useful, and we're saying let's use those to help us um, develop our software in a much more rigorous way. So. The thing, okay, the thing about this approach is it treats software as mathematics. That's, that's the key um, philosophy, that's the key insight. Um, if, you, if you've ever written any programs yourself, you might be familiar with languages like C or Python or Java. Uh, and in these languages, um, they don't have this mathematical uh, essence to them. Um, they're really you know, languages built by engineers to get stuff done, which, which is fine. Um, but academic computer scientists looking at how to write programs and how to write programming languages, they, they look at these programs and they say, they're mathematical objects and we can reason about them in the same way that you use algebra to reason about things in the real world, to reason about, uh, well, all sorts of stuff. Um, so so the, key, the key thing is to say that programs are mathematical objects and to use programming languages that um, make that easy, that, that are designed to help you reason about uh, programs as mathematical objects. So a language like, like Haskell, which is what we're using to, to build Cardano, um, is, is a kind of language where uh, it is inspired by mathematics. Um, you can use mathematics to reason about um, what the program means, what it does. Is this program equivalent to that program? Th things like that. So yeah, so the key step is realize that programs are mathematics and then use mathematics and mathematical techniques to, um, to reason about a program. And what, what do I mean by reason about it? I mean things like um, 
have a, a specification of a program in mathematics, in mathematical terms, and then to do things like proofs. You, you prove, in a, and this is a, a proof in the ordinary mathematical sense of proof, right? So a, an honest-to-goodness mathematical proof, which can be completely sound, you can have complete confidence in. You can write proofs about um, what your program, the, whether your program meets its specification. Um, that, that's kind of the holy grail. The holy grail is to say, we have a specification, which we understand, that that's a formal mathematical specification, and we have a, a program that is understandable in mathematical terms, and we can prove that this program meets this specification. That's, that's kind of the ideal situation. And if we can do that, you know, brilliant. I, I mean, that's easier said than done, um, but that's, that's the overall picture. Um, so, so what do we mean by specification for starters? Um, well, for example, um, if you think of a cryptocurrency, you might have um, a specification that consists of a set of properties. Like, and one property might be um, there should be no double spending, right? That's a good property for a cryptocurrency. Um, or you might have a property that you know, va value is not created or destroyed through a sequence of transactions. That, that's a high-level property, um, and that, that's not necessarily a complete specification, but uh, you might make up a specification out of a, a bunch of these properties. And then you would show that mathematically you would prove that, that this particular design of cryptocurrency uh, meets that specification. For example, uh, it might be possible to prove, and indeed I think people have proved this, uh, that the UTXO style of accounting that, that comes from Bitcoin, and it's the same, same style that we use in Cardano, that, that the UTXO model of accounting does meet the properties of a cryptocurrency. It does, you know, prevent uh, double spending and it does... And, you know, you knew that already, right? You, you already assumed, because, you know, Satoshi told us that, uh, uh, you know, the UTXO model should prevent double spending. And that, you know, but, that's, but that's an informal statement, whereas this is a mathematical proof that that is true, right? You thought it was true, but were you really sure that it was true? How sure were you that it was true? Well, if you have a complete formal mathematical proof that it's true, then you can sleep easy at night. That, that's, the, that's the point. So, yeah, you can prove things which you thought were true and you thought were obvious, but now, now you know them for sure. Um, and when you're doing things that are much more complicated, that, that really, really helps. Right? Um, okay, so maybe we should look at... Um, that, that's the general idea of, uh, of, of proofs and reasoning about programs. Um, maybe let's turn to what are we doing at the moment. Um, so as I said, we're not trying to reach really high assurance straight away. Right? We're going to do this step by step. We're going to improve the assurance, but it's not going to be high assurance, not in the sense of, like I said a moment ago, a complete formal mathematical proof, end-to-end, -end, you know, no ifs, no buts. What we'll do is we'll take particular chunks of the system and we'll um, do formal developments of those chunks of the system and then replace, you know, let's take, take a brick out and replace it with a better brick, um, which we will have developed in a way that is higher assurance, but not necessarily, you know, not necessarily high assurance, right? There's different, as I said before, there's different levels. Um, but we're working towards that goal. So, okay, so let's take a concrete case of one other thing that we're working on right now. Um, so, as you know, um, Cardano is based on the Ouroboros blockchain protocol, right? This is the, the underlying consensus proof of stake um, protocol that's been developed by um, academic cryptographers. And so that, that is a starting point, right? So the academics, the cryptographers, they, they went away and they thought for a year um, and they came up with, with Ouroboros. And they, they wrote an academic paper and they had it published. And they, you know, they, they are mathematicians, cryptographers are mathematicians. And they, they made a formal proof um, that has been peer reviewed by other people, other cryptographers, other mathematicians. They, they've done a, a proof that their Ouroboros protocol um, has certain properties. Like, remember I said earlier, you know, you might have properties like no double, double spending or whatever. So for the, for the blockchain protocol, the properties that they proved, it doesn't really matter for this case, but let me just take them anyway, it's, it's interesting. Uh, let's see, what are the properties? So one of them is that there's a progress property that um, given certain assumptions, uh, it's always possible, in fact, it's guaranteed that blocks will be produced. Um, and there's also a... Um, uh, not, not immutability, a um, persistence pr um, property that once blocks are of a certain depth uh, in the chain, that they are stable, that they, that they will not change under uh, you know, changes of, 
like like forking. You know, once they're a cer certain number deep, then the probability of them being forked is you know so low that it doesn't really matter. So those are the like two properties, and they they proved mathematically that their protocol meets those properties, that it satisfies that it has those properties. Um, so that, that, is, that is our starting point for building the software implementation that implements uh, Ouroboros. So what we are doing at the moment is we're doing a new implementation of Ouroboros. Uh, in fact, it's of Ouroboros Preos, which is the, basically the, the next version from the, um, uh, from the cryptographers. And so the, the point is that, that this mathematical specification that the, um, the academics, um, the cryptographers has made, is, is very high level. It's a very long way from the software. You know, it describes what the protocol should do, but you know, it's, it's short and it's very dense and it's very, lots of mathematics. Um, and it's a really long way from code, right? Um, similarly, you know, it's, it's like the difference between um, you know, Satoshi's Bitcoin paper and the Bitcoin implementation in C. Those are just miles apart, right? And so it's very hard to say that you know, if you if you think of Satoshi's paper being a specification, uh, it's it's not a formal specification, but it's a specification. And if you think of you know the Bitcoin C implementation being the code, it, it's they're so far apart that it's nigh on impossible to say that this code meets that specification. And and so then you know we can't we can't do the high assurance thing that I was talking about. What we really want is to be able to say here's a mathematical specification and a mathematically understandable uh, version of the code. And that these two things, you know, one implements the other. The, the implementation satisfies the specification. But if those two things are so far apart, like with the Bitcoin example, then it's just impractical. You can't, you can't do that. So how are we trying to do it? We st we've also starting with a, a mathematical specification. Uh, in this case, it's more formal than the Bitcoin one. The, the Bitcoin one is an informal specification. This one has, has proper mathematics in it. Um, but we still need to get to code that runs. So how do we do it? Well, the idea is we start with the, the original spec and we refine it step by step. And what, what does that mean? Uh, we refine it towards working code. Right? So that means we start with the original specification and we make another version of the specification that is a bit more detailed, that fills in, um, that fills in some details that are not, that are not described in the in, in the high-level version, because the high-level version of the of the protocol that's described in the paper is is so high level, it's almost unrecognizable. Uh, for example, um, right, everybody knows that blockchain protocols work by broadcasting blocks, right? That that you send you send out a block and other people receive a block. Um, but the way that the mathematical paper describes Ouroboros is, it says you broadcast the entire chain. Now. It's not doing that because they're stupid and they think that that's a good idea. They, they know that. But, but it describes it that way because it makes the mathematics easier. And it's a model of what happens in the real world. But obviously, the real protocol has to work by broadcasting blocks. Now, you can't broadcast the entire chain. I mean, think of the size of the, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. It's, I don't know, how many gigabytes is it at the moment? You can't broadcast that in 20 seconds. It, it's, it's nonsensical. But it's a useful mathematical model for proving that the protocol works, but it's a long way from what the code has to do, right? So the first step of our refinement is to say, well, let's go from a version of the mathematical specification that does things in terms of broadcasting whole chains, unrealistic, to something that works in terms of broadcasting blocks, slightly more realistic. There's still lots of things about it that are still unrealistic, or they still have details that have to, have to be filled in. But it's, it's now more realistic, right? That's one step along, along the road. And in fact, there'll be a whole series of these steps. And, and the point is, at each stage, we should be able to say that these two are morally equivalent, that they are the same in some way, that you know, the version of our specification that, that broadcasts chains and the version that broadcasts blocks are morally the same, or even better, actually provably equivalent, equivalent in some um, formal sense, for, in the sense that they achieve the same outcomes, they achieve the same, you know, that um, each node ends up with the same chain locally as they would under the original version. So that's an example of a, of a refinement. Um, so the point is that our approach is not to say, here's the spec, here's the implementation, we will directly prove that the implementation meets the specification, because they're so far apart. 
So instead we say, let's take the original specification and refine it a bit, refine it again, refine it again, refine it again, and keep going. At each stage, we're making design decisions, etc., etc., until we get to something that is low enough, le low, low level enough, that captures all the details of how the system has to really work. You know, it captures the details that um, we have to have a peer-to-peer -peer network, that um, we have to work in bounded space. Uh, you know, you can't use arbitrary amounts of, of RAM um, for the system. Um, that there are timing constraints that. Uh, things have to work using TCP. You know, all these kinds of details are not captured in the original high-level paper, but they have to be captured in the code because the code has to actually do those things. So by having this series of refinements, we get we get closer and closer to the um, uh, to the code. Let me let me draw a diagram. So uh, here's a, here's a diagram to to explain um, uh, what I mean and, and what we're doing and go into a bit more detail. So I said a second ago that we have this uh, mathematical paper that's written by the cryptographers. And that's, that's a, you know, a, a, an academic published paper, and it has lots of mathematics in it. Um, but it's not code, right? Remember, it's, not, it's, it's maths and not code. Um, so, and, it's, and it's written by mathematicians, cryptographers, as I say, are mathematicians. And I'm a computer scientist, and so I look at this, uh, this paper, and I look at it in a different way to the way that the mathematicians uh, look at it, um, me, and, me and my colleagues. And you know, we, we, we appreciate that it's got proper proofs in it, but but we look at these kinds of things slightly differently and say, well, actually, that's not really not as precise as we would like it, or it's not quite in the right form. We, we want to be able to reason about it in a different way. We want to use a different logical language uh, for describing the protocol. Um, and also, we, we aren't interested at this stage in the, in the proofs of the properties of like progress and persistence that, that, are, um, preserved in the, that are proved in the paper. We're interested in what does the protocol actually do? Because we need to implement it, right? We need to implement that protocol, and then, you know, if we implement that protocol, of course, it'll have the properties that um, that the guys say it will in the paper. So our first step is actually to translate their description of the protocol into our description of the protocol, which is in a, a different formalism, a different formal logical language. Um, so this is this is why I say over here with his maths mathematicians, and over here is computer scientists who are different kinds of mathematicians, if you like. Um, and so, so we, we, we describe again what, what the protocol does, how it works. Uh, so we have a, a formal language that captures the, the precise, uh, precisely captures the behavior, the meaning, you know, how the protocol actually works, when, you know, when people create blocks, all that kind of stuff. And then, so we, we've done that by, by reading the maths paper. Um, and so we need to show, we need, we need these two things to be equivalent, right? Our version, our description of the protocol and their description of the protocol. And that's the first step. So we, we write this description and, you know, we, we look at the maths and we say, well, we, we think that's right. And then we go and talk to the mathematicians and say, you know, can you understand this? Does that correspond precisely to what you wrote in your paper? Um, so this is a, a step that involves manual, um, manual inspection, right? So there, this, this requires, you know, people like uh, Agalos, who, who wrote the paper, uh, and, and other of the, his co-authors, and other, other mathematicians and cryptographers who understand that, and understand this, to say, yes, these are the same. You know, these, these describe precisely the same protocol. So that's step one, it, translating into a different language. Uh, and we use this thing called the Psi Calculus, which is a, a process calculus. So process calculus is a, is a thing from computer science. It's this, in the literature, it's been around for many years. There's lots of different ones. And, and these things are processed. These are used to describe concurrency, uh, concurrent systems and distributed systems. And what is a cryptocurrency, a blockchain protocol rather, if it's not a distributed system? It, it is a distributed system. So in principle, it seems like using a process calculus to describe um, the, the, the blockchain protocol is a, is a perfect match. So we're using a particular um, formal language, uh, this one called the Psi Calculus. And so what we have then is a description of Ouroboros, or Ouroboros Preos actually, um, in the Psi Calculus. And we, we think that is equivalent to the, the version that's in the paper. And it's our responsibility to uh, demonstrate that to, to, the, to the mathematicians so that they also believe that it's, it's uh, um, so that everybody has confidence that we're talking about the same thing, but in two different, two different descriptions. And then from then on, we, can, we, can, we don't need to trust in like, people understanding that two things are the same. We can then be a bit more formal from then on. So the idea is now that 
um, we do these refinement steps. So my, my diagram here sort of represents a series of refinements. Um, and and the, 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 one, the reason this one's big at the bottom is because there's lots of detail in the one at the bottom. The ones at the top are still small, they're still very high level, they're very abstract. They don't go into lots of detail. They just say, you broadcast entire chains and it doesn't say how that works. Um, whereas down at the bottom, you've got working code ultimately, uh, which is obviously very big, you know, much bigger. And in between, you have a series of, um, a series of specifications. These things are still specifications, but they're becoming ever more detailed. So the first one is still not very detailed. It's equivalent to the original paper. Um, and then as we go from one refinement to the next, so remember I said um, the first refinement we have to do is going from uh, describing the protocol in terms of broadcasting entire blockchains in one go, as if that were possible, um, to doing it by broadcasting blocks, right, which is more realistic. Um, it still doesn't, still doesn't say how you broadcast the block. It still doesn't talk about the peer-to-peer -peer network and things like that, but it's, it's one step along the road. It's more realistic. Um, so that's what's represented here. And then in general, there's going to be a whole sequence of others. And, and we haven't, you know, we're part way along the process at the moment. Um, and then how do we, you know, we're trying to show that these things are equivalent in, in, a, in a formal sense. Um, because, because remember, the final argument is going to be that our working code really does the same thing that the paper describes. Right? That, that's the ultimate goal. And, and the evidence for that should be evidence that these things are equivalent to each other um, and equivalent to the, to the original paper. And, it, and then if you put all that together, that is the evidence that our code implements what's in the paper and the paper has a formal proof of its correctness. So that is our assurance story, right? And that's the, that's the evidence that we, we produce at the end about the thing that we've built with all of these intermediate specifications as we went along. But it's, it's worth noting that uh, these intermediate specifications are not just there to, um, to produce the evidence that the thing we've done at the end is correct. They're also there for our benefit to help us design it, right? Because as we go from one step to the next, we're making design decisions. Like uh, when we go from a step that, it, that talks about broadcasting blocks to a version that talks about broadcasting blocks using a particular peer-to-peer -peer network, that is a design choice. You know, how does that peer-to-peer -peer network work? There's many different ways you could do it. And so when we do that refinement, we are at that stage making design choices. Um, so this also helps us with our, with our design process. And th at each stage, we can have confidence that uh, we've done things correctly if we can show these kinds of equivalences. Um, now, we may not initially prove formally every single one, but we want to do these, this stuff in a way such that we could if we needed to, or maybe later we'll come back and do them all. So in particular, at the beginning, we're trying to at least formally prove this first one so that we can show that we can do it. So that, you know, maybe we won't prove every single one, you know, at the beginning, but so long as we know that we can do it, then we can come back and do it later. But even if we don't prove every single one, just the process of going, just the developing things in this style gives us a much higher uh, confidence that we've done it correctly. Um, it doesn't produce quite the same quality of evidence for everyone else, but it's still a much more reliable process than just build the final working code and hope that it's the same as the, uh, as the maths paper. So, um, so what does this kind of equivalence look like? Um, so formally, we want something that says that, you know, if you, if you are happy with this one, you would be happy with that one. Um, so in particular, it's something like um, everything that this one can do this one can do. Uh, and every state that this one can re end up in corresponds to a state that this one could end up in. That's the kind of equivalence. Um, and we can express that, you know, every state, blah, blah, blah. We can express that kind of statement, that kind of specific, that kind of property. Uh, we can express that formally in, in mathematics and logic. Um, and we can try and use the, the, um, the logical language that goes along with psi calculus to prove that kind of equivalence. Um, so we're currently in the process of doing that. And we're exploring different ways, different tools, different, um, different ways of, of, of expressing these things and different ways of doing these kinds of proofs. Um, one in particular that we're um, playing with at the moment is a, um, a formal proof system. Um, you may or may not have ever heard of this. It's called Isabel. Um, and it's a, a very mature um, existing, you know, it's been around for uh, well, decades now, um, system for encoding on a computer 
formal mathematical proofs. So it's a really sound system. So if you have an Isabel proof of something, you're really sure it's true. I mean, it's, it's even a higher level of confidence than, than you doing a, a proof on paper. And if you do a proof on paper, maybe you got it right, maybe you didn't. You, know, you, need, you need another human to go and check it. With a, with a proof in Isabel, the computer checks it and the computer can tell if you've done it right. Um, so we're, we're, we're experimenting with using Isabel to prove these kinds of equivalences. And if we can do that, that's actually an extremely high level of assurance. Um, I'm not guaranteeing we'll, we will get there for everything. Um, it's an experiment at the moment. And I'm not saying that we will necessarily prove all of these in, uh, using Isabel. But we might, we might do the most important ones. Um, and we can always go back and do more of them later. So that, that's the idea. Another interesting thing here is that um, these aren't just specifications. These things actually work. These things are actually executable. Right? These are executable specifications. Um, even, even the first one, as I said, was very high level and sort of completely unrealistic in the way that it broadcasts entire chains. You can still run that in simulation. And that's actually extremely useful. Before you start to prove anything, proof takes a little while, it's tricky, and it's difficult, it's time consuming. Before you start to prove something, you can test stuff. So if you can run this one, and you can run this one, and you can you know, test that they seem to always do equivalent things, that they end up in, in equivalent states, then that's a good starting point for trying to prove that they always end up in equivalent states. Whereas if you run the tests, if you run, run these and they just do different things, we go, oh, well, I made a mistake. Let's try something else. So you can run all of these things in simulation. Um, so all of them are working code. Um, they just don't necessarily all run you know, in a real network. Um, they may only, only run in simulations. And, you have to, and the, the simulations will become more and more realistic as we go along. Until finally, um, there's not necessarily a big gap between the final specification and the working code. They, they can actually be the same thing, right? In, in, in computer science, the difference between a specification and working code, um, it's, it's a very gray continuum. I mean, there's no, there's no hard barrier between the two. Um, uh, programs can be specifications. Specifications can be programs. You can have specifications that are not executable, but an executable specification really is both. It, it runs, and um, it may not run very fast, um, but, it, but it runs, uh, and, and it is a specification. As in, we can prove it's equivalent to something else or, or, or things like that. Um, so if we follow this process in the way that I, I expect and I hope it'll go, it means that the final specification will actually be working code. Um, it won't just be, we end up with a specification and now we toss it over the wall to a bunch of engineers who go and hack it up in, in Haskell. The final one will actually be code that actually runs in the system. And part of the way that we're, we're doing that is, is that, because as, as you know, uh, Cardano is implemented in Haskell. Um, and, and what is this? This is side calculus. Well, that's not Haskell. Well, actually, we can, we can, we can make one be the other, basically, because we can embed side calculus uh, in Haskell. And what does that mean? That means that, um, so Haskell is, is, is very good for hosting other languages. There's this idea you may have come across, you may have heard of, called DSLs, Domain Specific Languages. Um, and that's where you, you use a small language and you embed it inside a host language. And the, the embedded language is for doing one particular kind of task. Like in this case, it's for describing concurrent processes. Um, but in, in other cases, it's for doing other things like describing probabilistic programs or describing logic backtracking programs or um, describing graphics combinators. You know, there's all, there's all kinds of little DSLs. And they can be, and the idea of an embedded DSL, embedded domain specific language, is that we can do one of those inside a, a host language. Um, examples of things that are not embedded that would be things like SQL, you might say, is a, a domain specific language, but it's it's not embedded inside any particular la programming language. Whereas what we're doing here is we're saying, we are taking the side calculus and we are embedding it inside Haskell. So our descriptions of the protocol are written in side calculus, but they're written in side calculus that is hosted within Haskell. And that's actually how we make them executable because we simply have a Haskell interpreter or Haskell interpretation for the side calculus that, that runs it in simulation. Um, and then the final one down here, it would still be side calculus in Haskell that we just run that uses now you know, TCP connections and all, and all the rest of it. Um, so that's, that's the idea, that, that the final version uh, will be 
still in the same style and the same language and the same sort of setting as all the previous um, specifications. And all of them can run in, in, in simulation. And the last few, the last, and at least the last one, should be able to run for real, uh, if you like. So that was the story about how do we make sure that we end up with correct working code at the end. Um, but correctness is not the only thing. Um, I mean, when, when people talk about programs being correct, they usually mean that they, they achieve the right outcomes. They, they sort of functional correctness is what, is what like testers talk about. Uh, or, people, or specifications. You talk about functional um, specifications. But there's also what people call non-functional requirements. Uh, and those are things like performance. Um, and actually, of course, performance is very important here. Uh, I mean, in a, in a blockchain protocol, um, it's important that um, you know, blocks are received within a certain amount of time. Uh, that um, you know, transactions make it into the system and are incorporated into blocks, and blocks get back to everybody in a certain amount of time. Right? You know, when you're using uh, Cardano and Daedalus, uh, and you create a transaction, create an ADA transaction, and you send it out, how long does it take for the person to receive it? Well, that's important. I mean, whatever time it takes, you know, if it was two days, that would be useless, right? If it was 30 seconds, maybe that's brilliant. Um, so performance requirements are, are really important. They are important requirements. So the normal sort of formal software development process often doesn't capture those, those non-functional non requirements, the performance requirements. Or, or equivalently, there's things like how much memory does it use? You know, does it require a machine with gigabytes and gigabytes of memory? Or will it run on your phone or your laptop? Or, you know, th these, are, these are important questions. So one of, the, one of the extra things that we're trying to do at the moment um, is to integrate performance modeling into this kind of process. Um, and that that is a, actually a, a very nice um, and interesting idea. Um, and, and it's not something that I've uh, done before. Um, so that's quite exciting to me. We're working with some, some other uh, experts um, uh, or who, who know all about this kind of particularly network performance modeling. Um, in, in fact, there's uh, some of the other videos um, on the Cardano website uh, are interviews with, with those guys, the um, predictable network solution um, people. And they, they have a, a nice again, mathematical model of, of performance, particularly performance for, for networking systems and protocols and things like that. And so at the moment, what we're trying to do is integrate their mathematical formalism for describing performance into our uh, approach of, into, into this design methodology. So that we don't have to wait until we get to working code before we discover, oh, it's too slow, right? That would be uh, I mean, terrible. I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole point of this kind of approach is that, you know, by the time we get to the end, you know, we know it's going to work um, you know, because it's, it's kind of correct at every stage along the way. But if it's only correct and not also performant, then, you know, then we've missed an important um, part of the requirements. So, so the idea is if we can integrate into this like, psi calculus uh, formalism, uh, a formalism that talks about the performance of the system, um, then we can we can show we we, we can um, be sure at the early stages of the design that we're not making any you know critical mistakes in our design that will cause us to miss our performance goals at the end. So we don't have to wait till we get down to here before discovering that we made a mistake back here. Right? We should be able to. The performance modeling should mean that we can tell at this stage before we've done these bits, before we've expended all that effort, we can tell at this stage that we have made a wrong design choice and we can make a different choice. Or it might mean that you know, something's impossible and we've got to do something completely different. But before we've spent all the energy and effort and time of, of doing these later stages. So, so that one is a, um, uh, another mathematical formalism. Um, so this is a, a mathematical formalism about performance uh, and it's called the uh, delta Q. And we write it like this. That's, that's just the name of the, of, the, of the system, of the formalism. But what's it really about? It's about modeling how long do things take to happen? And do they happen? Or, or do they fail to happen? Right? So it, it's a formalism that not only talks about performance, but it also talks about failure. And that's actually really important because real networks, you know, the internet, um, they fail from time to time. You know, connections get lost, packets get dropped, uh, you know, electricity goes off, people trip over wires. Right? Failure is a, um, an ever-present possibility uh, and we have to 
deal with that as part of our um, as part of our performance modeling. So it's actually it, it's it's it sounds all very complicated and algebraic, and it is all very algebraic. But the fundamental idea is very simple. Um, so a delta q is the is a probability distribution. So okay, uh, well, I'll start off by drawing it like this. And this is this is time on this axis. So let's call that in seconds. Let's say or microseconds doesn't really matter. Uh, these are units of time along here, and time so time goes that way, starting from zero. And this is uh, zero to one is the probability uh, density. Um, so, so what does this look like? Um, let's give an example. Um, let's call that. You know, let's call this seconds, just to make things simpler. And we'll say that most of it sort of goes like this. Right. So this is this is an example of a probability density function, where the, 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 what, it, what it, how do we interpret this? It says that the probability of something taking two seconds is is, is, is that much. You know, that, that's it, the probability of taking two seconds, the probability of taking three seconds is less, the probability, you know, there's, there's almost zero probability of it taking you know, less than a second, and there's very little probability of it taking more than three seconds. Most of it is sort of bunched around here. So that, that's an example of a probability um, density uh, function where most of it is kind of clumped around uh, about one bit. Now, a different way of showing that same diagram in a way that's a bit easier to, or a bit more useful, actually, is to make it cumulative. So uh, in this, you've got uh, there's one up here. This is because eventually, um, if if something is guaranteed to happen, eventually, then it okay, so zero down here and time this way again. Um, so the equivalent here. I mean, this will only be approximate, but hopefully you'll get the idea. Um, this will look like something that shoots up like that and then kind of tails off like that. So this is the uh, again the the time along here, um, and this is this is supposed to represent the th same thing but in a different way, and this is saying uh, after three seconds what is the probability that um, it arrived before three seconds, and here we're saying it's almost one or maybe it's in fact exactly one, um, so it's guaranteed. This, this in this example I've I've had it actually hitting the axis down here so. Um, uh, in this case, it's guaranteed to have happened by you know, about three and a bit seconds. And thereafter, it's just you know, one. Everything has happened before that. At this point, you know, so if, you, if this is, that, that's 0.5 halfway up. Uh, so this is saying that um, uh, you know, half, uh, at least half the time, or exactly half the time, um, you know, the, the probability is that it'll arrive you know, before whatever, whatever this point here is. You know, there's a 50% chance of it happening before you know, this, this, this point in time, and 50% afterwards. And so the, the rate at which it goes up uh, is, 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 is sort of the important thing, and where it gets to. Um, so if, if something, if you have a, um, uh, an event like you send out a packet over the internet, and you're, you're measuring how long does it take to get there. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of thing these things are used to measure. And the, the point is that you send out, a, you know, if I send a packet from here to there, um, how long does it take? Well, it, it's not always the same. I mean, people say, what's my ping time? Oh, you know, my ping time is 50 milliseconds. But it's not really exactly 50 milliseconds, is it? It's, it's sort of, it varies. Um, so the way to do it is to look at it as a distribution. Well, sometimes you could look at the min and the max, but this is a much more precise way of, 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 of describing that. But what if the packet never arrives? Right? What if it fails? Um, you know, normal probability density functions and cumulative uh, distributions here say that it, it must all add up to one. But if something, that wouldn't be helpful for modeling failure. So what we do instead, and, and what, the, what the delta Q says, is that it doesn't actually have to add up to one. You could have something where it, it, it never, so there's, there's, there's one at the top there, and it, it never gets there. Right? So, uh, and, and this difference is is the chance of failure, right? of, it, of it never happening. It's failed. Um, so like with a packet, sending out the packet, and it just never gets there. And, and what's nice about that is it lets us model failure in the same description as, as we use to model the performance. How long does it take to get there? Or it may never get there at all. Right? So a, a, a delta Q is one of these kinds of distributions. But it's actually much uh, in, in, we can build it up in a much more uh, algebraic way. 
I mean, the final interpretation is one of these sort of cumulative uh, uh, distributions here. But we, we can build it up in, in, in a much more algebraic way. So, for example, um, if I have, so let's just turn out, so if I have a, uh, a process that does something and then it does something else, and supposing, you know, we have a, a distribution of how long that takes, you know, supposing this takes um, so, you know, between uh, one and two seconds, uh, and, it, and it's randomly distributed, it's, it's anywhere between one and two seconds with, a, with an even, a uniform distribution between one and two seconds. Right, that, that's, a, that's a simple example of, of something. Um, and we had another one over here that takes um, between two and three seconds. Um, but maybe this one's one and two seconds with a, um, a 0.5 percent chance of failure, for example. And this is between two and three seconds, but there's also a you know, two percent chance of failure. So there's a, there's a, this is a delta Q. This is also a delta Q associated with doing this thing and associated with doing that thing. And we want to say, I'll do this one and then do that one. So this is sequential composition of, of actions and each of them has a delta Q. Well, there is a way um, of, of producing the delta Q of the overall of the composition. And this is really critical. I mean, um, being able to do this thing in a compositional way um, is, is, is really kind of the, you know, the computer science approach to things is break things down, um, make, build, build systems that, build algebraic descriptions that are, that are compositional. Because it's the, that, that's what modularity is. You, know, you, can't, you can't do this, these kinds of analysis unless it's modular. I mean, it's, or you go insane, it just becomes too difficult. So this is a, a modular way of describing the performance of the system. We say, you know, doing this, then doing that, and we have a, a delta Q of the one, a delta Q of the other, and there is, there is a, um, so this is a, um, uh, if, if, if in an algebraic style, if we have the delta Q of A and the delta Q of B, the delta Q of A followed by B is, is something in particular, and there's a way of computing what that is. Um, and it turns out it's a convolution, uh, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, but the point is that there's a, an algebraic description of the performance corresponding to what you're doing. And then we can look at this algebraic description of the performance and we can analyze that. And, and com the, whole, the whole point is then that we can compute the overall performance of the system based on the performance of the parts and how those parts interact. And that, that's the fundamental thing. So going back to the, the, the previous idea about you know, the side calculus and our specifications and refinement and stuff, the idea is if we can um, give a description of the, the blockchain protocol in the side calculus, and we can describe how those parts, how those, the parts of the description interact with each other and what the delta Qs of different parts of it are, we can derive by this kind of algebraic method the, the performance, the delta Q, of the whole thing. Uh, for example, we could, we could check, you know, given certain assumptions about you know, how fast the internet works or things like that, we could derive, by looking at the, the, the way we've described the protocol, we could derive, for example, uh, how long does an individual slot take? Like, how quickly can we get um, a block from you know, one slot leader to another? Can we do that in 20 seconds? Can we do it in 15 seconds? Um, you know, if, if we're trying to build a system to hit a certain slot length, um, that, you know, then that's our target. We want to be able to analyze that early on. So if we can build these kinds of performance models that say, yes, actually, given these assumptions, that should be possible. Um, then as we refine, refine it, we can check that we're still able to do that um, and that we can then yeah, build a system that meets its uh, performance goals. So, um, so we're, yes, so, so the delta Q method you know, is, an existing, is an existing algebraic method and we, we're, we're working with experts who, who, uh, who use this in, in analysis of real systems, particularly telecom systems. Um, but we're, we're, what we're doing that's slightly new here is we're trying to integrate that with our um, our functional correctness, our, norm, our side calculus uh, descriptions, so that we can do both at the same time. And, and if we could do that, that's a really powerful method. Um, it should enable us to build things with reasonably high assurance and hopefully, um, and also with, with the performance that's required, and hopefully not take too long over it. Right? I, mean, I, I said at the beginning that um, you know, building high assurance systems for like, you know, flight control software is phenomenally expensive um, and there's a lot of effort. Uh, well, if we, can, if we can do this stuff right, then by making decisions early on 
and not having to make mistakes and go back and do it again, we might be able to do things um, that, so that it doesn't take quite as long as, as normal um, uh, high assurance software development takes. So I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful that we can integrate these two things. We haven't done it yet, but we're, we're getting closer to being able to integrate these two methods together uh, so that we can yeah, um, produce good quality software that meets its performance goals. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. Um, and so this is the kind of uh, thing that we want to do for, you know, not just Ouroboros, but other, other kinds of developments um, where, where correctness and performance are really important. Um, so there'll be other parts of the system that we um, eventually apply this uh, kind of method to. So I think, I think yeah, that, uh, that just about covers that. Um, I hope that's not been um, too, too technical or too uh, hand-wavy. Um, if you're interested in, in further details of this kind of stuff, um, I'm sure we can provide some, uh, some links. Okay, well, thank you very much.